Well, I've just given you the case that reading is good for you. Reading gives you uh, all this language stuff, all this literacy stuff. I want to give you some other advantages of reading. Reading is fun. It's pleasurable. People want to do it. They're addicted to it. Victor Nell wrote this amazing book in 1988 called Lost in a Book. If you can find a used copy of this, this is such an entertaining book. First of all, he interviewed people about their reading habits. Here's what they said. Reading removes me from the irritations of living. For the few hours a day, I read trash. I escape the cares of those around me, as well as escaping my own cares and dissatisfactions. Isn't this true? Somerset Mon, quoted by Nell, who was a very weird guy, conversation after a time bores me. And my thoughts, which we're told are the unfailing resource of a sensible man, have a tendency to run dry. Then I fly to my book as the opium smoker to his pipe. Reading addiction. Uh, Nell uh, did a very interesting study. It's in the book about reading before you go to sleep. He had people come into his uh, lab and bring a book. These, these were dedicated pleasure readers, 26 people. They bring a book that they were deeply involved in, that they really were enjoying. Of the 26, 14 brought The Power of Reading by Steve Krashen. No. <laughs> He then asked him to sit down, and he hooked them up with all kinds of devices, galvanic skin response, like lie detection, uh, respiration, perspiration. All these are, me are measures of arousal. First, he got their baseline. Then he asked them to start reading. The arousal went up. But then when they put the book down, the arousal level went below the baseline. Reading relaxes you. There's one other bedtime activity that does that, but we can talk about that later. He, the, when he talked to these people, he found they were nearly all bedtime readers. 24 out of 26 read in bed nearly every night or most nights. Even if I read for only five minutes, I must do it. A compulsion like that of a drug addict. My addiction to reading is such I almost can't sleep without a minimum of 10 minutes usually 30 to 60 reading. We keep worrying about how to get kids to read. No, once they're into books, man, you can't get them to stop. Same thing with us. It's our book that counts. OK, we got two things going for reading. It gives you all these you know, grammatical and vocabulary things, and it's fun. There's more. Reading makes you smarter. It gives you knowledge. Now, when I talk about these studies, I'm about to tell you, I'm really talking about fiction, because these are studies in which they ask readers how much they know about certain topics, compare them to non-readers, et cetera. When they ask people how much they read, they're talking mostly about fiction. Victor Nell's data confirms this. Two thirds of books taken out of libraries are fiction. I'm in favor of nonfiction. I'm not against it. I think it's great. I write a lot of it. People accuse me of writing fiction, but it's not true, OK? I looked at the New York Times bestseller list for young people, 10 books, all fiction. It is fiction we're talking about. Keith Stanovich, University of Michigan, a number of studies correlating how much people say they read and how much they know about certain topics. People who read more know more about literature. This makes sense. They know more about history. How do you like that? They know more about science. You get all these things from reading stories. They have more cultural literacy. We're all concerned with this. They have more everyday practical knowledge. Readers are not nerds. They know more about everything. Career success and reading. Keith Simonton is my all-time favorite author on research on creativity. One of his books, his conclusion is, omnivorous reading in childhood and adolescence correlates positively with ultimate adult success. Lots of case histories, only two, just for illustration. Malcolm X. I saw the Malcolm X movie, uh, Spike Lee. Did you see that about 10, 15 years ago? It's a very good movie. Denzel Washington played uh, Malcolm X. He was so good that he was a better Malcolm X than Malcolm X. OK, it was so convincing. Anyway, the movie was very good, except they left something out, which was in the autobiography of Malcolm X. 
And that's his history as a reader. He says in the autobiography, when he grew up in the Midwest, uh, but that when he was in seventh grade, he was the president of his class doing okay. But then the family moved east. And he said his life in the streets erased everything he had ever learned in school. In prison, in his early 20s, he met a significant other, very important term in sociology, someone who opens a path for you. This other prisoner introduced him to the library, the prison library. Malcolm X says, I became a reader. You couldn't have gotten me out of books with a wedge. He tells about every night the guards would come by with flashlights. He was under the cover reading, reading with a flashlight, just like you did when you were in high school. My favorite quote from the book, he said, a reporter telephoned me asking questions. One was, what's your alma mater? I told him, books. Michael Faraday, genius scientist, one of the greatest scientists who ever lived, the chemist who basically discovered electromagnetism and changed the world. Einstein had Faraday's picture on his wall. Well, as you see, he lived 1791, 1867, a while ago. Let me tell you his story. Michael Faraday grew up in London, lived in very high poverty. When he was 10 years old, he left school and was apprenticed to a bookbinder. The bookbinder changed the world. We owe a lot to this bookbinder. He told Michael Faraday when he was a little boy, yeah, I want you to help me get the books together, put them together. Take some time off. It's OK. Take a few hours a day. Read the books. You find them very interesting. Michael Faraday read for 10 years. He read everything. He read Aesop's fables. He read everything. When he hit his 20s, he realized he wanted to be a scientist. It was reading that helped him find out what he wanted to do, his life path. He got apprenticed to a chemist, a famous chemist, published his first paper when he was 26, and changed the world with his research. Michael Faraday never took a test. Michael Faraday never studied. Got that? He had the two components that I think are the basics of an education. Free voluntary reading and try to solve problems of great interest to you. Those are the two crucial characteristics. And you'll see that schools that work encourage these two. And individuals who've made it without school, Edison, Lincoln, all had these two components. I want to present a new hypothesis today. You know, I should give you young people some advice. Would you like to become a big shot like me? And have people quote you and be invited to give speeches? And, oh, Dr. Krashen, we thought you were much older. We thought you were dead. <laughs> My grandmother took a class. I get this all the time. Oh, yeah, I took your lawyers there. I'll tell you the secret. Invent new terminology. It's worked for me. And it doesn't matter if you invented the idea. People will think you did. I keep getting credit for affective filter. It wasn't my idea. It was Julie and Bert. I keep telling them, but they don't care. They give me the credit. Uh, comprehensible input. A lot of people knew about that before I did. OK, James Asher knew about it. Kenneth Goodman, Frank Smith, a lot of people did. I put it in a theory, gave it a name, et cetera, so I get the credit. Some things I made up, some things I didn't. And you've got to make sure the terminology is not too clear. Because if it's really clear, people think they're just as smart as you are. And if it's a little bit confusing, they think you must be a lot smarter. I got that. Those of you who have taken uh, courses in my work, I plus one, everybody's confused. I really, I really scored with that one. Uh, so I gave you a new one, compelling, comprehensible input. OK, my idea. Give me credit. Here's another one. I have a hypothesis called the conduit hypothesis. I didn't call it there, but I'll tell you what it is. I hypothesize that we develop academic language in three universal stages. You know what academic language is. That's a bad term. It should be specialized language. 
because when you say academic language, it gives the false message that everyone should go to college, which is not a good idea, in my opinion, not at all. The uh, Obama administration has really pushed this. I really like President Obama, but his education policy, believe it or not, is worse than the Bush administration. Can you imagine? And it's getting even worse, all right? Anyway, they keep sending this message, college, college, college. They say, or career, but they keep saying college over and over. And this is a mistake. I don't think college is better. I think it's different. Some, for some people, it's, for me, it was exactly right. For a lot of people, it isn't. You need to do your specialized genius work in some other area that does not involve college work. Uh, we have done a, our society a disservice by focusing on college as universal. I will quote John Gardner, former secretary in the cabinet of President Bill Clinton, and he had this quote. If we praise mediocre philosophy and we disrespect competent plumbing, neither our theories nor our pipes will hold water. <laughs> this is exactly what's happening. Vocational education is gone from schools in the United States. The government keeps telling us there are shortages, shortages in technical areas. We need everyone to get engineering degrees. Uh, no, it's not true. The same thing is happening in Canada. I've read the research for you. It's the same as ours. There's actually a surplus. There's no shortage in technology. There are three engineers for every job. There's an overwhelming. In computers, there are enough computer programmers, exactly. There are a few little shortages in some areas in computer software development, but it's not large because there's not a lot, of, a lot of people involved. I'll tell you where the shortages are, and I got this from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. In the states, elementary school teachers, plumbers, carpenters, electricians, these, this is where the jobs are. And these people will have jobs long after the computer programmer is out of work because they have changed the computers around so much. You know, you've got to come up and do a new program, et cetera. So let's talk about, I'll sometimes slip and say academic language. We're really talking about specialized language that people need in their specialties. I maintain there are three stages that are universal for first language and second language. I'll tell you what I think they are, and I'll give you a case history as I go. Stage one, stories. Lots and lots of stories. In first language, we have a very rich research literature on this. Children who are read to regularly, either at home or at school, outperform children who are not read to regularly on any kind of a test you give them. It works because they hear a higher form of language that they don't normally hear in conversation. They get a little bit of book language, and they get excited about books, and they want to read on their own. There's a wonderful program in the States called Reach Out and Read. It's amazing. They work in high poverty areas, and they work through hospitals, and they wait till children come in for free checkups called a well child visit. They meet with the parents and the child, a volunteer will read stories to the child in the waiting room and give some hints to the mom or dad how it's done. When they see the pediatrician, the pediatrician gives them a free book. That's the entire treatment. You know, we spend millions of dollars on these fancy tests and things. No, just give them a book and tell them how to do it. Uh, they, have they have published about six high quality papers. Children in these who are influenced by Reach Out and Read with as little as three or four visits make up anywhere from a third to half the gap between the rich and the poor on vocabulary. So this is quite, this is the power of read -alouds. In second language acquisition, we have a program I'm very enthusiastic about. How many of you have heard of TPRS? Okay, good. The rest of you, if you're involved in second language, your homework assignment is to Google TPRS. Teaching proficiency through reading and storytelling, the the idea of the class is that the teacher and the students interact to construct a story where the students are involved in the story. There's sometimes the characters and they act it out. It's personalized, which makes it compelling, and it's a story that makes it compelling. And our research on it is excellent. It is first class, in my opinion. 
all this stuff is pleasant as well. Kids like to be read to. Students in TPRS classes are far more likely to go on to advanced classes. They like it a lot better, and it works, and the research supports it. My case history. The case history I'm going to give you is me. It's the one I know the best. I would, I'll tell you about my read aloud experiences. I really would like to tell you a story about how I overcome great odds. You know, that, you know, I had all these daunting challenges, but because of my grit and determination, I said, none of that's true. Um, you know, supposedly, between lives, there's supposed to be a committee meeting between you, the people talk are you, your spirit guides, and the people you've been reincarnating with lifetime after lifetime. And you have this discussion to determine what your next lifetime is going to be what lessons you have to learn. I don't remember the meeting, but I am sure they gave me a free pass. This lifetime has been easy, let me tell you. I've had problems, but not like most people. My family life when I was young, I grew up in a family with nearly a complete lack of family pathology. <laughs> Mom and dad were great and they loved each other. Let me tell you about my sister. I just talked to her yesterday. I will never understand my sister. She's, she's older. She's always been so nice to me. Why? I've never been nice to her. I don't do anything for her. She calls me up, are you OK? We've had some family issues with money. Not issues, just some business. She's always watching out for me. No, no, don't give that to me. That's for Stephen. Make sure, OK? So let me tell you about literacy. Mommy and Daddy had lots of books in the home. They were readers. They read to us. My sister read to me. My sister introduced me to stories on the radio. And the last thing I'll tell you about this, and I want you to give my sister some applause, when I was nine years old, my sister took me to the public library and got me a library card. Bravo. Now, that's good. So I had it made. Well, the next stage, I'll tell you what happened. The next stage, I think, is free voluntary reading, self-selected reading that you do on your own. All the novels, all the junky books we read when we were in middle school, when we were teenagers, that's the second stage. That stage is not enough to bring you to the highest levels, specialized language. It's the bridge. It's the bridge between what Jim Cummins calls conversational language and academic language. Oh, I see. You know who he is. Well, I got into it because even though I grew up middle class, upper middle class, and I was OK in reading, all the other kids were middle class, too. So I wasn't the best reader. In fact, I was kind of in the mediocre readers group. My dad didn't like that. He knew the cure. He brought home comic books. My first stage of pleasure reading was comic books. Thousands of comic books. And I will ask for applause from my dad in a moment. My father gave me a free, open budget for comics. I could buy as many comics as I wanted forever. Of course I did OK in life. I couldn't help it with all that. It would be very sad if I wasn't successful. So in those days, comics were not as good as they are now. This was in the 40s. Comics took a big leap forward in 1961 with the founding of the Marvel Comic Book Company, Stan Lee, who invented, I think, the, one of the most important figures in English literature, Spider-Man, a superhero with problems. The Marvel influence has been gigantic, huge. And it has spread over to DC, to the other companies. Today, all comic books are much, much better. How many of you were ever comic readers? How many of you are still comic readers? OK, guys, you've got to do this. This is important, OK? I want to tell you a little bit about today's comics and Stan Lee's influence. When I get to know you a little better, I'll tell you how once when I met Stanley. 
I had lunch with Stan Lee. He paid. <laughs> that is the highest award. I'll tell you what happened. I heard him speak at USC. He spoke to the comic book club, and I went over to hear him. I went in the room. They were my people, the nerds. Okay. And he was giving his great lecture. And I asked a question. I said, when is Peter Parker going to go to graduate school? <laughs> yeah, he's the scientist. I said, good idea. Let's talk. He invited me to lunch. I made all these notes for him about graduate school and what it was like and how to get a TA ship. He included it. It was briefly in the newspaper. And there were a couple of stories in the comic books. And he made the professor look like me. <laughs> this is my moment of fame. Having lunch with Stan Lee was so unbelievably wonderful. It was amazing. We talked about comics the whole time. I gave him all this information. His favorite character, the Silver Surfer, very interesting, because the Silver Surfer is by far the most tortured, ethically tortured character in all the Marvel Universe. The welfare of his family versus the welfare of everybody else. This is heavy. Let me give you a little hint of what comics are like today. Graphic novels, I'll tell you about a couple. And I'll tell you about DC products, to be fair to both sides. If you're going to start, I would start with this one. came out about 20 years ago. Um, Batman Returns. Some of you have read it by Frank Miller. It's remarkable. Batman is now 56 years old. He still goes out and fights crime and does all this. But when he comes back, he's tired. He has to take aspirin. Today would be you know, ibuprofen. He takes aspirin, takes a hot bath, and all that. He's still friends with Superman. Superman has a cameo, a guest appearance. And they talk, but they have very different philosophies. Batman has become Dirty Harry. He has his own definition of what he should do, what is right and wrong. He doesn't listen to the police commissioner anymore. You know, in the original Batman, you had the bat signal, and he went out and fought crime. He doesn't do that. He decides. Superman is conservative. He says, if the police say to do it, I do it. It's not for me to decide. They have a long, interesting conversation. The great thing about the comic is that the comic book takes no position. The comic book just presents the different points of view to the reader and exposes the reader to think about probably one of the most common ethical problems we all have. Our values versus what is expected of us, what is legal, what is considered right, wrong, um, et cetera. And it is always a struggle. Uh, by the way, I really liked one of the Marvel movies. It was Iron Man 2. Remember that one? That's where Iron Man, Tony Stark, has been called before the US Senate. And the senators say, you know, you got this Iron Man costume. You go flying around, blowing things up. Uh, this is dangerous. You're a citizen. Give it to the military. We'll take care of it. You can't have it. And Tony Stark, Robert Downey, says, uh, oh, no, look, I'm doing stuff you guys should do. I'm out there performing good deeds. I'm fighting evil. I'm keeping it. Again, the movie does not take a position. That's what's beautiful about it. Look at The Watchmen. It was made into a movie. It's a DC comic. Who's watching The Watchmen? A quote from Cicero. If we have superheroes, who's making sure they're doing the right thing? Do we want a benevolent dictator? Comics have improved enormously. Take a look. OK, from there, I went on to sports stories. I'll tell you just a little bit about sports stories. For me, it was reading baseball novels by John R. Tunis. Turned out our friend and hero, Jim Trelease, the author of the Read Aloud Handbook, also read John Artunis when he was a teenager. And he sent me all this stuff about John Artunis. It's absolutely fascinating. John Artunis wrote a series of novels about a mythical baseball team, the Brooklyn Dodgers. But he made up the characters himself. And it's, you know, it's a series, the same characters as they grow. The last one, oh my gosh, called World Series. Here's the last chapter of the last one. I'm going to assume you all speak baseball a little bit. It's the last game. Each team has won three games. It's the fourth game. This one decides everything. It's the last part of the game, the last of the ninth. Two outs, bases loaded, score four to two. Everything depends on what happens now. The pitcher is the father. The batter is the son. 
and they haven't spoken for 15 years. This is good writing. If you want to find out, you'll have to read the book yourself. <laughs> After that, I went to science fiction. This was a golden age of science fiction. This was Arthur C. Clarke, Robert Heinlein, before he went a little nuts, in my opinion, uh, Ray Bradbury, all these wonderful writers. This is what I read when I was a teenager. This was my curriculum in high school. This is how I developed. This is where my vocabulary, grammar, all this stuff came from. I went to classes. I took classes in English literature, as some of you did. We did American literature, British literature, uh, all that stuff. Sorry, there is no unit on Canadian literature. I see this now as a real problem. Anyway, I know, I know. Uh, anyway, this is back in the 50s, though. Uh, I remember we had to read these novels and take quest to tests on them. I don't remember a single book that I read, not one. I couldn't tell you what was in it. I'm only vaguely aware of who the authors were. Somebody named Shakespeare, something like that, OK. I remember everything about the ones I read on my own, everything. I pick them up now, I know what the story is. My son and I reread a lot of Robert Heinlein's early novels. We still found them absolutely fascinating and well-written, um, et cetera. This did not bring me to the highest point. It made it possible. I did not know what I wanted to do. My undergraduate was pretty much the same as high school. <laughs> Alfie Cohn <laughs> said about high school, I can identify with this. In high school, I paid attention to everything except the teachers. All right, that pretty well says it. I finally found what I wanted to do in graduate school. It didn't exist before that. It was called linguistics. I didn't know about linguistics then. Before that, nobody did. But I liked linguistics. That helped me get closer to what I eventually uh, wanted to do. It was the best I could do at the time. And I thought it was absolutely fascinating. The first class was general linguistics. The second class was syntactic theory. And the textbook was written by the dreaded Noam Chomsky. <laughs> and it was called Aspects of the Theory of Syntax. I picked it up. I understood nothing. <laughs> it could have been written in Bulgarian. I had no idea. I got a strategy, and it worked. I decided to read the complete works of Chomsky, beginning at with his first publication. I went back to 1958 and read his first publication, Syntactic Structures, which was written for an audience that did not understand his point of view, which was very different. It took a while to read. It took me you know, a week or so. It was a small pamphlet. But I loved it. I like linguistics. I'm a member of this fringe group. Okay. I thought it was amazing what he did in the book. I thought it was great. After that, I went to Current Issues in Linguistic Theory, his next publication. I then read every journal paper where he was attacked and where he responded. By the time I got to 1963, Aspects of the Theory of Syntax, it was about a month, I picked up Aspects. It was totally clear. I understood everything. In fact, it was transparent. It was easy. Now, I don't know Noam Chomsky. Uh, we're not pals. Our names are sometimes mentioned together in articles, similar philosophy, all this. I met him once. <laughs> he came to my university to talk. I shook hands. I said, I'm Steve Krasher. And he said, who? But Chomsky was my teacher. Absolutely. It was from him I learned linguistics. That's what I thought I was learning, and I did. Without realizing it, I learned how to think like a scientist. I also started to acquire academic style. I learned the rest of academic style when I got to the dissertation phase. I got interested in an area of left-right brain differences, which was the fad then, and I thought it was fascinating. I still do. And the, the uh, research tool we used was called dichotic listening. You put headsets, you know, competing stimuli each side. One ear hears one thing, one ear hears the other. And the, what you hear tells you what side of the brain, what they report tells you what side of the brain is doing the processing. So my job in our research team was to read the entire literature. I started at the beginning, and I discovered that there was one person in the field. This happens in a lot of fields. You find the central character. And the central character in dichotic listening who developed the technique and did all the 
fundamental studies was a professor from uh, Ontario, Western Ontario, named Doreen Kimura. I read everything by Doreen Kimura. I started with her first papers. Now, this is a lot easier than reading linguistics. These are research studies, experiments. They're usually about three pages long. So this is the introduction. This is the procedure. This is the results. Here's what may or may not have been happening. Here's what we'll do next. I read stuff that she wrote. I read what her colleagues did reacting to her. After about a month, I had read about 60 pages, 60 papers. So I had a pretty good idea. Without realizing it, I also learned how to proceed scientifically, and I learned how to write up a research paper and do applied statistics. I had a feel for research paper. I have never met Doreen Kimura. I'm sure she doesn't know who I am, but she was my teacher. This is how it happens. And I'm saying this is the only way it can happen. The way we do academic language teaching is we teach it directly. A scholar will go out and do discourse analysis and text structure analysis and find the discourse of various fields, like the language of chemistry, how experiments are written up, and give students the rules and the specialized vocabulary. This is a multi-billion dollar industry that has never worked. No one has ever made much progress this way. I've tried to do it, I've tried to teach it. No one can keep it straight. Various reasons why, it's too complicated. You read an article about text structure of abstracts and scientific journals, it's so hard to read. They're so deep, the discussions. I barely understand them and the next journal comes out, there are alterations and changes. You can understand it, teachers can understand it. How are we gonna teach this stuff? You absorb it, you acquire it through massive readings. It's not learnable, but it can be acquired. Vocabulary is an easy example. The average educated adult speaker of English has a vocabulary in English of anywhere between 50,000 and 150,000 words. That's not 50,000 trips to the dictionary. 50,000, draw a line from the definition, write three sentences with every word. You just can't do it. In fact, the best evidence I know, uh, one of my uh, former students, Victoria Rodrigo, did a very interesting study in Spanish, published in Spanish in a journal called España, where she compared vocabulary size of people who learned Spanish as a second language, grown-ups, who were now graduate students in Spanish language and literature programs, compared to native speakers who are not readers. Who had the larger vocabulary? The second language people. Those of you who speak English as a second language, in this room, I will bet that your English vocabulary is far larger than that of George W. Bush. <laughs> no question. I love this job. I can't be fired. I'm emeritus. It's great. <laughs> so this is the way it happens. It happens only through reading. The problem is, how do we put this in a curriculum? How do we do it in school? I will only make one comment about this before I come to a dramatic, exciting conclusion. I'll only make one comment and quote Frank Smith, Canadian. We have school and we have the human brain. Which one can you change? People want to change the brain. Can't be done. 